So we're going to do a quick overview. So the first thing is like how to get started and organize your team. And again, this is focused on like building, you know, building custom integrations yourself and implementing them. Uh, um, you know, there's other things where you're sort of get a package integration, implement those, those make the, those things somewhat easier. But we'll talk about how to get started and organize your team, uh, documenting the business requirements, understanding the source and target systems, building a preliminary data mapping document, making a technology decision, building a complete data mapping document, getting approval on the business requirements and mappings, developing to the specifications, creating test cases and validation plans, managing the testing process and shared documents, and then moving to production and beyond. So those are the overall topics. So some of the best practices on how to get started and organize your project. Uh, first, I already said this, is give yourself a break. Acknowledge that system integration is hard, right? And plan for it, right? Assign a project manager or some coordinator, uh, if, particularly if you've got multiple parties, vendors and, and integrators and, and, and the like. Um, document and communicate. So specificity matters, unspoken assumptions or hidden fixed functionality is, like very, is, is deadly. If, you're, um, if you've got stuff that is happening in your integration or needs to happen, it's not spoken, like it's, it's the small stuff that tends to matter, right? And can keep you in that, um, you know, basketball cycle at the end where you can't get to the thing because there's all these sort of tiny little assumptions that are that are not not working. Um, agree on what is the success criteria. So as, as you'll see in a minute, not to be a bit of a spoiler alert, but you know we encourage everyone to create or, or follow a mapping document that's pretty thorough and and then you know have test cases that you know test to that, develop to that, sign off on that. And, and, and say that is our success criteria is that we will you know, sign off on everything on this list and complete any issues and then we will go live and then that's good, that's, that's it. So, or some other process, but just agree on like how we're gonna get to the end. Um, make sure that all the parties are working towards the same goals and are collaborating on any issues. So, you know, if, as, as I've said a couple of times, most issues can be fixed in, in, in many ways, I suppose to say. Um, so avoid finger pointing, right? So if you have the, you know, understand how you will be able to resolve a problem where it could be fixed either by vendor one or vendor two or the system integrator or by you, like who's gonna do it? Like how does that, who makes that decision to step up and, and, and resolve that problem? That can, that can paralyze a project if you don't know. So if you're all aligned on the goals and have sort of know how to do that, that'll, that'll really help. Um, and expect that requirements will change and plan for it. So this is maybe contradictory to the agree on what is the success criteria, <laughs> but the one of the things gonna be dissatisfying is that you know, you set up this initial requirements, initial mappings, and then you go through the project and then things change. And now you're sort of off the grid, right? You're off this, this document and, and now it's sort of open for anything in the world, right? You need to plan for that. You need to know, hey, we expect that the requirements will change as we start figuring out how we're gonna use these other systems we're integrating or, or we see different data scenarios or we just learn more. And if we know that that's gonna happen and we have a way to update our requirements and our design uh, and our mappings, uh, and then to, to keep, we may move our success criteria a little bit by modifying that, but we at least it's, we still have a, a documented success path. Um, and then lastly, say finding problems during testing is a good thing, right? Um, I, I mentioned in the challenge where you have people who say, you know, they're abandoning, you know, abandon all hope, <laughs> you enter, you know, this, will this ever end? I don't know. Um, we, we've had a, had a, a client once who said to us, like, you know, we never, I've never seen a, a test process without a, you know, without an error come up during testing. And they, they said this like it was a problem. And I was trying to say, you know, this is like, I want to see problems in testing. I want to discover the issues in testing. Uh, and that should be celebrated. Like, we should be, yay, we, we found an error. We can fix it, you know, because if we didn't find it, then we would have, it'll come up in production, which you don't want it to happen. So you want to make sure to catch things there. Obviously, you know, no errors would be ideal, but, but you, know, you want to be looking for problems and, and resolving them and not getting discouraged. Um, so the next thing about the business requirements here is to determine, oh, that was the organizing your team, All right? So the next thing is documenting the business requirements first. Um, many system integration projects start off with, here's my, here's an API, or here's a flat file format, or, Here's a, a database table and do the mapping. Right? It starts with mappings. And um, it, I want to change that. <laughs> like, like we have to move away from that because the mappings have to follow from business requirements. So um, what you want to do is to you know, 
ask yourself, why are you moving this data? And do you need to? Like, what, what is the data being moved? Um, if, if that's difficult for you to do and you're, you have sort of a current manual process that you're replacing, I'd recommend um, you know, sitting down and, and actually mo like, like recording or documenting the current manual process and figure out like what's happening, what's going on in that manual process. What because because ideal an ideal integration should, in the end of the day, have the same result as someone keying the data in. Hopefully with less you know key errors and obviously more automation and faster. But you want to have you know everything get populated in the same way and any sort of decisions happen. So it, watching someone do the manual process can be really informative to you, particularly because there's things that that. Decisions that the user is making when they're doing data entry that um, they might not even know to bring up as a business requirement, but you know, oh well, I just dismissed that. But, you know, I overrode that, you know, budget limit because that's just what we do. Well, all right, we need to, like the system isn't going to be able to make that decision. We have to write code for that. And and as I say here, computers are stupid, right? So they don't know. So <laughs> you have to tell it very explicitly that. Um, the other thing that, to note about business requirements is that a lot of times people ask for real-time integration and uh, uh, or an automated integration, and and I could go on about the difference between real-time and automated and all that, but um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's totally hands-off. Like there are still some things that that uh, do make sense to have as a manual review or decision, like duplicate resolution or or, or error checking at some point. Um, so you have to have realistic expectations for what those are. Uh, the other thing to think about with business requirements is what triggers the move, what's the initiator of the process, what is included in the move. Um, so is there, like, are we just sending over just admitted applicants or, that have changed and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Like, that's often not covered in the mapping document to think about. And to, to name it from a business standpoint really helps. How do you handle errors? You know, is this, is, is, um, can you reprocess information? How does that work? What's that supposed to do from a business standpoint? So documenting those as much as you can first, and, and again, if it's hard to do, like think about maybe, you know, mirroring the, the person doing data entry. Um, the other thing, is there, is there a different behavior for like create or update? Uh, do you need to have duplicate resolution as part of the process? Are there performance or speed requirements? Like is this something that has to run in, you know, in two minutes or one minute or, or four hours or something, you know, depending on the size of it. Uh, the other thing to think about from business requirements is can this project be done in phases? Is there some sort of critical implementation, that, the critical set of stuff that needs to be implemented now? And then maybe other things that are nice to have. Um, and then if you're doing a major system migration, uh, and for, you know, for the person who asked about um, ERP implementation, this is a really important to think about is your sort of breadth versus depth of your data integration. So you know, depth being, um, how much data do I want to move? Like, do I want to move every record, you know, historically that I have, or do I just want to move the last two years or the last six months or some population within that? You know, so that's the depth of the data. Um, it is usually not much more work once you've built the migration and once you've built the code that actually moves the data and loads the data. It's not any more work to load a million records than it is to load 10 records, except in validating and testing this record. So it tends to be that older data gets more messier. So um, you know, a lot of times people decide not to move a lot of depth of data because they don't have the capacity to test and validate all that. And those are, that's a sort of critical system migration things. And it's not just ERP to ERP, like if you're implementing a new CRM and you wanna figure out how many, what, how, what set of leads you wanna move over, those are decisions you have to make. Now breadth of data is about, all right, Am I bringing over 50 fields or 100 fields? You know, am I bringing over, uh, you know, all my addresses and my activity uh, history, or just the most recent, you know, activity status or something? So, all like, what types of data? 300 fields or, or five? Um, so that's important to to make a decision on. And and more data, more breadth of data requires more development work, right? So that's that's the trade off. Are you are you, you know, doing more work on development or or more work on testing and um, and the answer to your depth and breadth questions are de will be decided by your business requirements, right? So why are we doing this? What do we need to be able to do in the next system? All right, other things to avoid from a business requirement standpoint is, uh, and this is something that, that people talk about all the time, is moving data into a transactional system as a pass-through to reporting, right? What, is, what do you mean by that, Brian? I mean that if you've purchased a, um, 
trying to not use a real example. <laughs> you know, uh, you know uh, uh, a blah blah system, right? And you have and you want to move all the data from that into your SIS because you've got feeds from your SIS that go into a data an operational data store that you do reporting off of. Um, and sometimes people want to migrate, you know, all of the data from that, we'll just say like from a CRM or, or whatever, into that system because they wanted to feed the reporting system. Um, and that's admirable. Like I, I agree with the sentiment. Like you want to bring over whatever you can, and you want to have you want to have that like leverage what you already have to feed that reporting system. The problem is that transactional systems have a high threshold for accuracy and quality, and they're not built to easily load with data from another system. So if you're trying to bring historical or other data in just so that it can get fed to the reporting system, like think first about can I just pass it straight to the reporting system um, in some other way? Uh, because basically it's just, you know, you're, you're asking to take something and pass it through one of the more like complicated things and also something that can really break. Like you, you don't want to mess up your core ERP just, you know, if you can just pass it through the reporting system. That's something to avoid. Um, the other thing to try to avoid from a process standpoint and business requirements are system integrations where you need to be updating the same data in two systems and want to synchronize it. A lot of times this can be just be solved from a business standpoint. So, you know, we have a person in our CRM and then they move over to my SIS and then they say, well, if I, if they change their address in the SIS, I wanted to go back to the CRM, but if they change their address in the CRM, I wanted to go back to the SIS. Usually, you know, the problem with that is that now you have to build some pretty complicated business logic to manage the synchronizations of that and, and what happens, and you don't really want to do that. Like, it's much easier to say, you know what, if they're an applicant, update them in the other system, or make it so that the integration, if it is going back the other way, that it doesn't actually overwrite, but it just adds sort of like a student system address or something like that. Um, and then lastly is this postpone for perfection. This is an old saying from the old CEO at Data Tower I used to work. He said, I'll take um, continuous improvement over postpone perfection every day. So um, that this goes to the sort of phases thing. If you can figure out how to integrate what you need, like the bare minimum of what you need, take it and then build on that. Um, and, and don't wait for the um, to get everything working. Um, all right. I'm going to move along. I'm, I'm spending way too much time on this, but it's a good topic, though, so I just keep flying through it. So another best practice is understand your source and target system. So um, the first thing you want to do is, like, if there are APIs or standard import export files, understand what they are, what's the data requirements for them, um, uh, what sort of error behavior do they have, what the documentation of them. Document that, the fields of, of those source and targets. Maybe it's also that you're just going directly into the database or maybe you're going into store procedure or some other methodology. Um, you know, document the objects and fields and the data definitions. The definitions are, are key. Like, like, like if, if you don't have those, to be able to say, like, what is this thing functionally? Um, description of it, data type format, is it required, expected data values that the, each one of those individual systems wants for those fields. Just understand that. Make sure you do. That's the minutia that's going to cause problems if you don't understand that at the end. Um, we, I, I also like to talk about this thing called a protocol data system. So that's if you have to take one system and produce a flat file, and then that flat file gets picked up by the other, other system, you can sort of think of that flat file as its own data system, right? So understand what that is. What are the requirements of that flat file, right? So um, understand the source and targets, and or maybe if it's an API, what, the, what that, that is, and, and document it well. Once you have, have that, the source and target, and you know that really well, then uh, you can build an initial mapping document, right? It, it's, I called it initial because actually, this actually may or may not be your final mapping document. So you're going to talk about how, how you want data to flow from one side to the other to fulfill your business requirements, um, if, where things map from and to, what's the directionality, and you sort of want different mapping documents if you have different transactions, so maybe there's a, you know, posts and gets and different flows, so if you need to have different mappings, include um, the selection criteria and maybe the initiation details in some of this, but you, we have that mappings, translation, substitutions, default data. You have complicated logic that's supposed to happen if this field, then that field, and or concatenate this thing, like write it up sort of a narrative. Um, and now you sort of understand where things are going to go from beginning to end. Um, you might not know how it's going to do that exactly in the middle, but you know that it's got to it's got to get from this point to this point to fulfill your business requirement. 
And when you have that, now you can make your technology decision. So how, what architecture and tools will you use to make that move, right? Um, do you need some sort of interim system, like an enterprise service bus or some custom code to hand things off to? Is there gonna be a flat file in between? Can one system call the other? Uh, how will this be automated and scheduled? So you have to figure, make that decision based on those requirements and, and may, either using existing tools or figuring out other things that you have.